Are you going to keep a diary that says, this is when I finished the notes, or this is when I met with X, Y, or Z. I'm going to meet with two or three other different groups. Because apparently meeting with your own group is not getting it done. So let's have bigger group meetings. You know, if you want me to organize that, that's fine. But I think you need to have interactions with different groups because some of those groups are just failing. And I don't I don't want to see that. It's not, you know, that's supposed to be your buffer. And there are plenty of points for you to still do good because you've got quiz three. The final replaces your lowest grade, which I hope is this grade. And uh, there's the poster grade. That's worth a quiz. It's worth a quiz. Okay. So there's lots of points to be made, but so don't you're in this class, don't give up. But the first thing you did right is come to class today, because usually after quiz is when the attendance just goes like that. And I'm gonna give the, the quizzes back today. Yeah. Can you uh, try and put the lecture notes up sooner? Because it's really hard if you put them up the night before or something. Okay, uh, that's up. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, that's actually the general of two things. I'm gonna ask you to give me some hints about uh, you need to sign it because if it's anonymous, I get all kinds of really funny things. Okay, <laughs> funny is a, a euphemism. Uh, so I want your feedback halfway through the semester. If I get it at the end, I can't do you any good. So that's that's a very good suggestion. It's you know people get overwhelmed, but that's no excuse. So that's I can make sure that that happens. Good. The lecture seventeen was actually posted Oh, okay. So th this one wasn't up. Okay, so that's something that goes up here that I can't change. I wish I could. So the only thing you can do is you know piazza. I just I just So that's okay. That's, I'll try to be more careful. Maybe I can get uh, Sibeli to, to overlook and make sure I'm, if she doesn't see it, she can have. But piazza is the best way to do it because I don't. I'm like you. I don't go to Blackboard every day. Unfortunately. So. Anything else? Okay. Um, so, we start a new topic. Um, because I like chemical signaling, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I talk about it a lot in endocrinology. And uh, most of you should have had a really nice introduction, particularly if you took uh, Dr. Dini. So this, this chapter has a lot of really basic stuff that you've already seen. But if you didn't have Dr. Dini, you might need to read uh, chapter 15, this is chapter 15, very carefully. Okay, it, it, there's a lot of stuff in there that is just way over the top. So we're gonna kind of, you know, we're gonna follow this pathway because it cuts through a lot of that stuff that is not that important. It's like, it gives you every scheme possible and then doesn't talk about examples. I like to talk about examples that show concepts, okay? So we'll start by um, looking at the general uh, scheme of how a signal transduction um, system works. There's signaling pathways. And what does transduction mean anyway? It means to convert one form of energy, so the input energy is converted to an output energy that's different. And what we mean in biology is an extracellular, this is all about extracellular signaling. Extracellular signalings are, have information encoded in their three-dimensional structure and concentration and pulse frequency. That gets decoded by the receptor and then transduced with the receptor and some trans, uh, transducer proteins into a new signal. That's transduction. One form of energy with information into another form of energy with information. And so the in, intracellular signal is usually different from the extracellular. Now we've talked about one signaling system, that is the steroid receptor, where the internal signaling system is the same as that external. The steroid just comes in and activates a transcription factor. This is somewhat different, okay? So let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, let's focus on the first two learning objectives, and that is to describe this general scheme of mainly hydrophilic. The hydrophobic stuff we talk about, those are steroid signals, and we'll, we'll mention them again. But we're talking about things that can't cross the membrane without some help. And they don't need the, the hormone or neurotransmitter does not have to enter the cell. That was actually a revelation that we didn't know until the mid-60s. They used to think that the signal came in 
and we the cell played with it or something and read it or you know I don't know what happened, but it never enters the cell, okay? Except to be internalized. At that point, the signaling system is over. That's an extinguishment. If the cell, if the signal is actually endocytosed into the cell, that's the sensitization. It's actually to turn the signal off. Okay, so let's figure out how that works and how it can be modulated. And then we want, we've got to have a conceptual map, okay? A uh, conceptual map. So learning happens in three different stages. The first one is to identify the important material. That's why I'm here, to show you this in the PowerPoint. The second stage is form a concept map. That's what you has to happen up here. If you can't organize the information, you can't learn it easily. So that's why you should be making a concept map of everything we've talked about. It doesn't need to be so formal as Dr. Dean. He used to have, you put the wrong verb, you got it wrong, right? You know, that's, I don't see it that way. If you have some sort of flow chart where you start with the most general thing like signaling and then break it into pieces, and you can organize this by receptor type, by second messenger, by kinases, you can do it all kinds of different ways. And the more ways you do that, the better your network concept map becomes. Okay. And then you have to internalize that. And that's by repetition, by self-testing, by talking to your group members, by reading, by doing exercises. That's the third step in learning. Okay. So all three steps have to happen. Okay, and you're in charge of the last two. But I can help you along with that. All right, so this is chapter 15. It's huge. It's, it's ridiculously large, and so I'm cutting through it. Um, we started out with one question is, um, multicellular animals did not arrive, or did not arise, until 3.5 billion years after the Earth began. Okay. When did bacteria or unicellular animals arrive on the Earth? You may know. One billion. So there's a, a 2.5 billion year gap between bacteria or prokaryotic primitive <coughs> animals in multicellular organisms. Why? What's the what's the explanation for that time? Gap? Well, one explanation is that you had to develop an incredibly um, complex signaling system to get the cells to talk to one another. Guess where that signaling system came from? It came from primitive, and these are yeast. <coughs> so this is actually advanced compared to a bacteria because this has a nucleus, right? But this is still very primitive, okay? So this is, these are um, budding yeast, and when one of them uh, secretes uh, what's called a, mate, a mating factor, the other one gets a direction, okay? It's actin cytoskeleton actually grows this protuberance towards that. So this has been going on a long time. You know, they had yeast bacteria, uh, Viagra a long time before we ever had. Okay, so this is, unicellular organisms were already developing the talking uh, machine scheme to each other. There's a way, a mechanism that they communicate. And so all you have to do is get all these stuck together in the same extracellular matrix, and then you have a multicellular organism, okay, in which the signaling gets really complicated. Okay, so this is the general plan, uh, and we're focusing on hydrophilic signals. These are soluble in water. And so they're not going through the plasma membrane, so the hallmark of a receptor is what? It's got to have an extracellular and intracellular domain. That's the first primitive, basic, characteristic that a, a signaling receptor has to have. So it's got to have an exoplasmic domain that can bind the signal, and then it's going to change shape so that the cytoplasmic domain looks different. Something's going to be different, because it's going to recruit proteins that transduce the signal into a cascade of, of um, activated effector molecules. Okay, So we have conversion, we have or transduction, we have amplification. Usually it's a, a kinase activating a kinase activating a kinase. So every time you go from one kinase to the next, there's an explosion of a thousand new kinases that are active, and then those thousand activate another thousand, and so this is the amplification. And finally, you get down to one key uh, kinase that's usually the granddaddy that goes around talking to several target 
uh, protein. And we've already talked about this kind of stuff here, gene regulatory proteins. But we need to talk about metabolic enzymes inside the cytoskeleton. You know, this is why that yeast chain shape in response to the leading factor is the cytoskeletal structure completely changed. Okay, so lots of different things going on. All right, so it, that was the simple case. And so there's all kinds of ways to regulate this. So there's the basic scheme, and then there are ways to fool with it, right? So you've got a, a signal molecule binding to a receptor, and then it's going to activate a transduction scheme that results in a second messenger. And so this is the new output form of the message. And so the, output, the input form was carrying information, soft, hard, fast, slow, all kinds of information was encoded in the concentration and frequency of that um, molecule hitting the receptor. That's decoded into a new concentration, frequency, and location distribution throughout the cell. That is decoded by intracellular proteins that pick up the signal. And those are usually kinases. And why are they kinases? Because enzymes amplify the signal. That's a tiny little signal. And so it does not have to be large because you have several amplification steps. Okay, so we go, we want to come and regulate this target here, right? So as you go through here, you can have different signal transduction pathways that converge. In fact, we'll talk about a coincidence circuit, which is very useful electrical engineering, but we also have that same system. It is, if a signaling pathway is very dangerous to leave on, like it kills the cell or divides the cell, those are so hotly regulated, they usually have three different signals have to impinge on one thing for it to go forward. That's called a coincidence circuit, okay? And so there'll be several examples of that. And once that goes off, then it determines which proteins are called effectors. They're the ones that go around and activate enzymes, activate the transcription factors, activate the cytoskeleton. And then you get this cell phenotype that changes, right? All right, uh, some of these things come into the nucleus, obviously. Um, one of the things that happens is the signals can now diverge to interact with different pathways. So this is not a linear thing. It is a network. It's a network. And so you have to deconvolute the entire network to figure out what the output is that you're going to get. Okay. So it, and the problem with your book is that it does this for like 25 pages, showing you all the weird things that could possibly happen and never gives you an example. And I don't think people learn well that way. I think we need a concrete, we need to go, that's epinephrine, and this is the adrenergic receptor, and then you'll, you'll have a concrete example that you can use. Okay, so it's going to go into the nucleus. Are there ways to block it? Yes. The, all the way along here, there are ways to turn this off and on, or slow it down, or speed it up. Okay, so there's, modulation is a big issue. Anchoring is that you can get signaling to happen in a particular place, but not over here. And where it happens makes a big deal of difference. If it happens right by the nucleus, it may control transcription. If it happens by the plasma membrane, it may control cell shape. So anchoring is really important. Okay. All right, and then ultimately we get in here, you should be at home with that. It's got to bind to a response element. It has to recruit co-activators, co-repressors. It's got to either stabilize or destabilize the pre-initiation complex. It has to change the folding of the DNA. All of that stuff is under your belt now. Okay, or it should be. Okay, um, let's go actually to the outline before we go into the details of G-protein signaling. Okay, so we're going to start, so the one way to, uh, to conceptualize your uh, understanding of signal transduction is to organize it by receptor type. And we'll start with one of the, the most famous and most, the largest group of receptors, and that's G-protein coupled receptor. You've already seen what this receptor is going to look like. It looks like the bacterial rhodopsin example of a multi-pass membrane protein. They all have seven alpha helices that pass in and out of the membrane. Okay. Um, are there a lot of these things? In humans, well, when I, these notes first came out, 
well, it's, it's still about 700 in the human genome, 700 different receptors. Now, if you're a real nosy animal in the house, they have a thousand G protein coupled receptors just in their nose, in their olfactory system. So each one detects a different, slightly different chemical. No wonder they're sniffing it. Okay. So we're a little bit less capable in that area, but still pretty much. So the other thing is a large fraction of the pharmaceutical that you give a patient are going to affect the G protein coupled signaling pathway. So that's why we need to know it well. Okay. All right, so uh, an example would be uh, of ligands. It can be something as esoteric as light. That's actually a ligand, okay? Um, odors, peptide hormones. Now we're talking about something more familiar. Glucagon that raises your blood glucose. Luteinizing hormone, which uh, causes men to secrete testosterone and women to ovulate, okay? Uh, neurotransmitters, acetylcholine is a, a favorite example. We've already talked about one type of cholinergic receptor. Which one was that? Do you remember what it was called? Nicotinic. So the nicotinic is actually a ligand gated ion chain, right? So that is the receptor. And so actually the second messenger is that influx of sodium. So that's so that's a really interesting system. But there's two different flavors of acetylcholine uh, receptors. There's the nicotinic that bind to the ligand nicotine, and then there's the muscarinic. And all of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are G protein coupled. And so we'll use that as, as an example. Okay, so <clears throat> the structure for these G protein coupled receptors are all the same. That has that seven um, membrane spanning alpha helices, and they look like this. Sure. Okay, so they all look like that. You know the rule. If the, the uh, in terminus is extracellular, which it always is, where's the C terminus? Uh, it's, the rule is if it's odd number, it's got to be the opposite side of the membrane. So actually the part of this protein that's going to communicate with the, tra the, the transducers, it's actually part of the transducer because what's going to happen is the one role that the hormone, say like LH, is coming from the pituitary, the one, it has one role and that is to change the shape of this protein. So it's going to bind out here, this thing is going to shiver, and then usually this third intracellular loop and this C-terminal segment will bind and recruit a signaling protein called the G protein. Okay. So that, that's the plan. But you can always immediately recognize them because there's seven of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So it's all about uh, shape change. And so here's some of the typical ligands. We talked about them, just a few of these. Uh, this is not a list that you need to memorize, but these are the, the, the target tissues that they affect, so it's all very uh, medically related. Okay, so let's go back uh, to this general plan. And again, these g protein coupled receptors uh, are going to relay the signal after they've undergone a shape change uh, because they bind the ligand, so they, they change shape and they're going to recruit this thing that's called a G protein. Now, this G protein, uh, actually, if you're very fastidious in your vocabulary, G protein only refers to the heterotrimeric G proteins, okay? But what's happened is people have gotten sloppy, they don't, take, they don't have a, a background, they pick this up on their own, and so they started calling everything that has a GTP binding site is called a G protein. That's the way it's going to get. That's, that's the way that you're going to hear it because people get sloppy. That's why people say apoptosis instead of apoptosis, okay? Because they just don't have the background. All right, so don't criticize them. Just understand that that's the way it is. But it, it looks a little bit, the G protein signaling system is a GTPase, okay? That you've already seen. And you know this is a molecular switch. And you don't have to learn anything new because you know that it has to, this has to bump into a GAF, a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, in order for this to lose GDP and pick up GTP. That's the same thing as phosphorylating protein. Okay. So it's in a new conformation, and these things always, always work by protein-protein interactions. This is not considered an enzyme. 
Does it have enzymatic activity? Yes, that's the switch part. But the, the shape change is the business end of this protein. Okay? So it's going to undergo a shape change, which makes it turn on. And so this can then bump into proteins and turn them on or off. It controls proteins. Okay? All right, so we go back to this. What happens is the signal molecule causes a shape change in this G protein coupled receptor, GPCR, in short, naloxone or G protein coupled receptor. Okay? So the GPCR changes shape and then it's going to recruit the G protein. Okay. The G protein, a classic G protein, has three subunits. Okay. It's got, let's see if we can zoom in on this a little bit. Yeah. So it's got an alpha and a beta and a gamma subunit. You notice that the alpha subunit looks a lot like RAS, except for one thing. What's missing? If this was RAS, what would it be missing? I just took a test over RAS. So it has two anchors, right? One's a parental isoprenal group, uh, one's a palmitic acid. This just has a parental group. Okay, so it's got a patel, uh, a um, rubber tail, okay? And so it's going to hang on the membrane. In fact, the, the alpha subunit cannot dissociate from the membrane. Okay. And the beta subunit is a Klingon. It has no lipid tail. So it must remain uh, bound to its partner, which is this gam uh, gamma subunit. So the gamma subunit has this coil-coil motif. It's got a lipid tail. So the reason that the beta is always hanging on to the gamma is so that it is a indirect, it's, a, it's an indirect um, peripheral membrane protein, whereas the gamma subunit is a lipid anchored integral membrane protein, as is the alpha subunit. Okay? Now, what, where is the switch located? The switch is located in the alpha subunit. That's the thing that either binds GDP or GTP. What's the gap? The GEF is the activated receptor. The G protein coupled receptor is the GEF in the system. So that's what's going to activate. Let's go back up here to the whole cartoon. That's what's going to activate this G protein. Okay. What does that mean? So when it touches it, the first thing that happens is the G protein goes, whoa, and it dissociates. But while it's doing that, while it's dissociating, it's changing its shape, so it loses GDP and picks up GTP. That's the first change. Okay? That causes a fairly dramatic uh, conformational change such that it, it almost, in some cases, it completely dissociates from the beta gamma subunit. So those two split apart. The alpha subunit is bound to GDP, but at this point, both the alpha subunit and the beta gamma are actually signaling molecules. They can independently affect different pathways. Sometimes the alpha subunit turns something on and the beta gamma subunit will turn it off. So you've got two signaling molecules for the price of one. <coughs> now, what's happening to the receptor? The receptor is going to bump in this into the G protein and cause this exchange, and it's going to immediately dissociate and activate at least a hundred other G proteins. So here, this is the first part of amplification. That activated receptor can continue to activate G proteins until the ligand dissociates or it's internalized. Those are the two things that will stop this thing from talking to G proteins. So this thing will typically go and bind and dissociate, bind and dissociate, and touch 100 different other G proteins. So now you've acti activated 100 different G proteins, and these will go and talk to this guy which is a transducer. And transducers are generally, but not always, enzymes. So this is a rather odd looking structure because this is a protein that's called adenylate cyclase. And so now we've, we've, we're talking about a very specific G protein. This isn't just any G protein, this is a G sub S. And the little subunit tells you which type of G protein you're talking about. So you need to know that. Okay. It was the very first class of G proteins that was discovered, and it's stimulated, hence the term S. Okay, so that's where it gets its little name. And you can have a G sub S alpha, 
and a G sub S beta gamma. But you don't ever have G sub S beta and gamma by themselves. They're always together. Okay. Um, think about some of the other G proteins that you're, uh, or actually G TBases that you're familiar with. How is this different from, uh, let's say, ARF, for example? What would be different about this, this system? Think about ARF. And that's going to be on test three hours. It wasn't on this test. How does it differ? Start with the structure. What does ARF look like? It's not Mickey Mouse. Well, ARF is usually uh, soluble. It's not a membrane protein. Exactly. Okay, so one of the big deals is this thing does not have retractable landing gear. Its landing gear is always deployed. Big difference. What's the set? Obviously, no. ARF is a monomer. This is a hetero trimer. And so that's why this family is often called the heterotrimeric G protein family. In the old good days, when we just knew about this family, we called that's a G protein, those others are GTPAs. But now it's all gotten confused. Okay. So when you say heterotrimeric G protein, you, you, mean, you mean this thing. Right here. Okay. Um, all right, so that's what's happening. So you activate this thing, and so this is a dilate cyclase. What's wrong about this? This looks like a single pass membrane protein. It actually has 12 alpha helices. So it should go in and out, in and out, in and out, 12 times. It's a big thing. Okay. And a dilate cyclase takes ATP and turns it into cyclic AMP, which I'm sure you've heard of. Okay. That's the second messenger in the system. So now we have a new category of protein, and we have a new second messenger that's going to categorize the signaling capital. All right. Um, let's see, what else? So we have all these examples. Um, I don't want to go into too much, but there's actually real movement in these uh, various alpha helices is called switch one and switch two. We're not going to worry about that. But understand that losing GDP and picking up GDP causes a conformational change in this protein. And that's why it's going to dissociate. And that's why these two will probably separate from each other. Uh, some of these don't separate. They, they stay fairly close, but they swing out widely and talk to different proteins. So it's generally the idea that this separates from that. That's in the active state. Okay. And you can see there's the hydrolysis state. And so this is the, uh, actually, this is the same look as a zinc finger. It's got a beta, uh, a beta strand that's adjacent to uh, an alpha helix, but there's no zinc in here. So it's, it's a motif. This thing's strong. You put three negative, each one of them has uh, minus two. You put six minus charges into a protein, I promise you it's going to flip around. Okay. okay, so we have the activated complex. They go talk to proteins. And so this is the, um, this is the uh, transducer molecule. This is also, the, the G protein is also considered a, a transducer. And this G protein can go talk to several adenylate cyclases. So there's more amplification, right? This thing can talk to 100 different G proteins. The G protein can go up to dozens and dozens of adenylate cyclic. So you see how it's amplifying the signal when you start with one ligand. Okay. All right, so if you uh, activate this transducer enzyme, what it's going to do is just repetitively convert ATP into cyclic ATP. That is the second messenger. And the second messenger cannot do anything by itself. That's a really good rule to remember. It has to go bind to something. And generally what they bind to is an effector molecule, which is often a protein kinase. This is the first one discovered. And because it's activated by a cyclic AMP, it's called PKA, protein kinase A. And how this works is the cyclic AMP, uh, two molecules bind to each of two regulatory subunits. So when this Regulatory subunits are not bound to cyclic AMP. They are holding the catalytic subunits inactive. So this is a ligand-activated uh, enzyme. 
So you get two each binding to each of the two regulatory subunits. They dissociate from PKA, and it is now active, and it can go into the nucleus, and it can go into the cytoplasm, and talk and activate many different things. How? By putting phosphate groups on serines or threonine. So another question is, when I say kinase, if you're talking about signaling, you need to say, is it serine threonine, or is it a tyrosine kinase? It makes a big load of difference. And there's actually some that do all of that. We call them dual specificity. So on your card for poster children for PKA, put the type of kinase. All right, let's go back and, okay, and then finally, just to finish the story, this is ATP. What happens is you, you lose a pyrophosphate discarded, <coughs> and then this is why it's called a cyclic AMP, because this is a, uh, a diester bond that's formed between a three and a five position. And so this is when it's active. So the question is, equally important, not only how do you turn this on, but how do you turn it off? Well, you need a protein that's called a phosphodiesterase. And the, the name of it tells you which type of, of uh, second messenger that it's going to turn on or off. This is cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. And so it's going to break that bond and turn it into 5' AMP. Signal is over. All right, so we've gone through a lot of stuff. So let's go back to the outline just to pick up the, the familial details. Okay, so we've talked about all these things. Um, we get down here, we're going to bring this up again and again, but every step of this process is regulated. And in fact, one thing that's really interesting is, uh, is the large number of off switches. So I just showed you one way to turn this signaling pathway off is to destroy the cyclic <coughs> AMP. That's really good. Uh, in fact, that's why caffeine has its effects on you, is that it inhibits the phosphodiesterase so that the cyclic AMP signal stays high, and that keeps you away, okay? Or whatever you do when you have caffeine. Study, hopefully. All right. So. Uh, another way to turn this signaling pathway off, so caffeine is going to prevent the off switch from occurring, uh, but there are ways to get around that, and so there are a whole family of proteins called Greeks, and they're not fraternity members. They are enzymes, so they're G-protein coupled kinases. G-protein coupled receptor kinases is what Greeks say. And so what they do is they go to the receptor and they phosphorylate the, usually it's, it's the, either the third intracellular loop or the C-terminus, because I said those two are the ones that interact with the G-protein. And if you phosphorylate that, the G-protein can no longer touch it. Okay? So Greeks are an off switch for the receptor itself. So that's a good plan. Phosphorylation is not only an off switch, it can be an on switch. Or vice versa. Okay, now, are there diseases? Yes, tons and tons of diseases. And so, if you get this system down, then you can understand how it goes wrong. So, one of the problems, there's a disease called male precocious puberty, which I talk about in that one over there later this afternoon. Um, and what happens is the LH receptor um, is activated without its ligand. So, we just think it's a wonderful thing to just keep, stay in the active state. So, the red receptor is mutated and it always looks like it's bound to LH. And so these young, uh, young boys, actually, uh, it's, it's always on, so it's always activating the testosterone production pathway. And so these children actually become sexually mature way early. And so it walks into your office, and you're an endocrinologist, it's one of the first things that you think of. You see precocious puberty. Okay, so you could turn on the uh, receptor and have it independent of the ligand. That's actually how a lot of, of cancers get going. The G protein coupled receptor will pretend that it doesn't need the ligand, and so it becomes independent from extracellular control. And that's why cancer goes runs away, is because it doesn't need the ligand anymore. So this is a really common uh, uh, problem. Okay, let's take a break here and then we'll go through this family status. Okay. Um, 
fortunately, we've actually covered a lot of the other uh, protein families. So really, the only one that we haven't spent any time talking about is the G protein, the, the heteroprimary G proteins. Because we've already talked about all of these, right? And these are all monomeric. And they used to be called the small GTPase family. Okay, but you'll hear them uh, called G proteins. Um, and so they all act uh, similarly in terms of being the switch. So they're they're relevant to the alpha subunit of the heteroprimary um, version of the G proteins. Okay, um, what they don't what they don't have is the ability to self cut the GTP. They require a gap. Uh, the GTPase activating protein, which is a gap. Uh, what's interesting about the, the alpha subunit in the heteroprimary version, it's got its own little gap domain. So it's quite capable of turning itself on. It's a little slow, but it can do that. Okay. So that makes it very different. Besides the fact that there are always three pieces, three subunits, and these are all monomers, that, so that's a big difference. What about these? Uh, most of these have retractable sub uh, retractable lipid anchors, RAB, SAR, ARF. These are the only two that we've talked about that don't. Okay, RAN is a soluble uh, small GTPase, and RAS is a little bit like the alpha subunit on a heterotrimeric, except it's got two uh, lipid anchors all by itself. Okay. Um, the only other thing I, I'd point out that this uh, remember that RAB actually needs to not only uh, bump into a GEF to get rid of GDP and pick up GTP, but it also has to have, it has to bump into a GDP dissociation inhibitor. So this GDP dissociation inhibitor is keeping it in the off state, and so it needs to bump into the GEF to get rid of that um, state where it's um, bound to this GDP dissociation inhibitor. The alpha subunit of a heterotrimeric has the GDI activity built into it, right? And so it can act as a dissociation inhibitor, but it can also act as uh, the GTPase activating protein. So it's got two capacities to keep the alpha subunit turned off, right? Split GTP and keep it from dissociating uh, from the GDP associated from the alpha subunit because if it keeps the GDP, it's going to be off, right? All right, so we talked about uh, elongation factors or initiation factors. Um, that's the eukaryotic <coughs> IF2 that was on the exam. Um, again, that's a, a monomer. We talked about dynamite, so really we're down to, to this group here. And the, let me scroll down because I can't do it. We've already talked about the, the basics and, and the cycle, but just to uh, point out this big point is how do you activate the GTPA? So is the only way to do it to, to use that alpha subunit's intrinsic GTPA's activity? No, there's actually three things that can help turn it off. So it has the intrinsic ability to split GTP. That sends it back into the GDP state, right? And now it's off. Okay, but when the it touches the effector molecule, like when it binds to dental cyclase, that that protein-protein interaction makes it more likely that the GTPase will activate and split GTP. So bumping that's that limits the number of effector molecules it can activate. So it can't go on for endless time and activate all the dental cyclase because each time it bumps into one, it becomes more likely to split its own GTP. Okay, so that's number two. The third thing is there's a whole class, just like there's a whole class of Greeks, there's a whole class of RGS proteins, regulators of G-protein signal. And these are essentially very potent gaps. So do you have to have a gap? No. Are there gap-like proteins that bump into uh, the heterotrimeric alpha subunit? Yes, and there, there's about 25 of them, okay. RGS proteins. So, there is control at every single step to either turn it on, turn it off. And that's because if you don't, there's uh, dire consequences for doing that. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about second messengers. And we've already gotten into the whole issue of second messengers. So when you're deconvoluting a signaling pathway, you want to know what kind of receptor it is that tells you what kind of signaling pathway you're going to use. Is it a G protein couple? receptor pathway 
And then once you know it's G-protein coupled, you need to go a little deeper. You need to know, is it a G sub S G-protein? So you need to know the family of G-protein that's being activated. So is it G sub S or is it G sub I, which is actually an inhibitory family that we'll get into. Okay, so once you produce this mythical second messenger in the cytoplasm, uh, it carries the information that that signal molecule outside the, the cell carries. Okay? How does it encode that information? There's actually four different ways. Uh, it's the concentration of the second messenger is important. Okay? So that should reflect the concentration of the signaling molecule outside the cell. The change in pulse frequency, because what happens is the, the second messenger will go up, and then a lot of times it'll crash, and then it'll go up, and it'll crash and the pulses come in different frequencies, okay? So there's a classic example where you put the hormone uh, uh, arginine vasopressin on a cell, okay? And arginine vasopressin comes from your posterior pituitary, and it causes you, your kidney, to reabsorb water. If you go out and drink too much alcohol this weekend, it will inhibit the production of arginine vasopressin by your pituitary. What will happen is you will lose lots of fluid, un be unable to retain the fluid, and you'll become dehydrated, and that's called a hangover. Okay? That's how a hangover is produced, is arginine vasopressin. So if you have one concentration of arginine vasopressin outside the cell, it's going to bind and it's going to activate a signaling pathway that happens to be a calcium second messenger. And the calcium is up, and it goes down, up, and down. And so if you put a low concentration of ABP on that cell, the pulse frequency is slow. It's up, down, up, down, up, down. Now you double the concentration, and it goes up, down, up, down, up, down. And then you can triple it, it goes up, down, up, down, and just, uh, it looks like a you know, heartbeat going really fast. So the frequency of the change in concentration is an additional set of information that's decoded by the signal. So we have concentration, we have pulse frequency, and then, guess what? It's not just one signaling pathway, but more than one. So it could be pulses of cyclic AMP, pulses of calcium, and the combination of the two cause one specific, specific effect. Are you getting the idea this sounds a lot like gene transcription, where it's a, combino a combinatorial array of collection of things that make each response different. It's not the fact that every cell that is in the liver uses cyclic AMP and every cell that's in the kidney uses calcium. That's not the case. It's for every particular cell type, there's a unique combination of second messengers. So it's concentration, it's pulse frequency, it's the combination of multiple messengers, and it's where. Where does it happen? Because a lot of these enzymes, they carry the signaling pathway are localized. They're actually attached to proteins. In fact, for our signaling pathway we've talked about so far, you have one G sub S, activates adenylate cyclase, you get cyclic AMP, you activate protein kinase A, and protein kinase A is localized by what are called ACAPs, A kinase attachment proteins. And so they grab onto the kinase and keep it right by the membrane, or keep it right by the nucleus. Why is that important? It tells the kinase what it's supposed to be doing. So location is really important. Okay. And then again, superimposed, we need to ask three questions about every second messenger. And that is, what generates the messenger? What are the targets of the messenger? Is it an enzyme, is it channels, is it genes? Or, and what destroys the messenger? So that's a question you ask about every single signaling pathway. Okay, we've already started talking uh, a little bit about cyclic nucleotides. <coughs> Pardon me. This is just some more details. Uh, I'll let you, you look at this, but I want to make a couple of points now. Um, there's actually lots of different vertebrate or isoforms, so you can't say it's a dilate cyclase, a dilate cyclase, a dilate cyclase. It, it depends on what isoform. Okay, so just understand there's that diversity out there. Um, the G sub S alpha stimulates adenylic cyclase. So in some cases, the, the G beta gamma is the one uh, that stimulates it. And sometimes the G beta gamma actually uh, antagonizes the adenylic cyclase. So that's, it gets pretty complicated. All right. 
we have uh, a new G protein. So not, there's not only G sub S's, which was G stimulate. This is, <coughs> as you might expect, G sub I is inhibitory. So what does it do? It turns off the different cycles. So there's another off switch. It's a whole G protein signaling pathway devoted to do one thing, turn off the different cycles. If it's an important signaling pathway, then it's going to have lots of control over it. And add this to your toolkit. I would start keeping a pharmaceutical toolkit. The control, you should already have that, you know, for um, different things that we've studied so far, cytochrome A's and B. Um, what else have we talked about? Um, things that regulate glute families. Uh, so keep those chemicals in your toolkit because you can use them to dissect the signaling pathway. For example, what if you wanted to ignore the effect of the hormone ligand and its receptor? You wanted to get rid of that as a variable. What would you do? Well, you can go past that and use a drug called forscolin. It comes from a plant. Um, and it directly activates adenylate cyclase. So you say, I want to know what happens downstream from adenylate cyclase. So you're in control if you do that. So you use these drugs. If, if the system does not respond to forscolin, what does it tell you about that cell? It does not produce a cyclic D pathway or pulse. You, you can't say, well, it's because it doesn't have a receptor. Well, you don't know that because you've you've gone past that. You're asking what's downstream. It doesn't seem to have a new one cyclic, is what you conclude. Or is it reasonable to think it doesn't have ATP? No, there also is an ATP, so it's pretty much gotta be it has to have a new one cyclase. And forstolin activates all of them. Okay, so you can use these to dissect different pathways. Okay, and guess what? If there is a cyclic A and P, there's going to be a cyclic G and P. Right? Makes sense. Uh, and so uh, it does slightly different things in different situations. And so uh, what generates the cyclic G and P is a slightly different. There's a receptor version where the receptor for the extracellular signal is actually what produces the cyclic G and P. So you get rid of all the middlemen. You get rid of the G protein. The receptor is a guanylate cyclase. And there's a, there's a really well-known hormone called atrial natriuretic peptide, AMP for short. Where does that come from? It tells you right here. This actually comes from your heart. So did you know that your heart is an endocrine gland? It is. Uh, when your blood volume gets too much and your blood pressure goes too high, A and P is secreted and it goes to your kidney and says we need to get rid of some of this um, excess fluid and it actually stimulates ADP release and causes your blood pressure to drop. You think that's a good clinical thing that people are looking at? Absolutely. So there are drugs that activate the, this type of receptor uh, because what you do is you get the, the effects of A and B without having to be somebody A and B itself. Okay, so what's different is this is um, a receptor that binds A and P on the extracellular domain, and the intracellular domain is a guanonyl cyclase. Okay. And it's going to take what? GTP and turn it into cyclic GNP. So it, it works a little differently. And then there's this weird one. Okay, so this is a different class of soluble guanonyl cyclases, and they float around in the cytoplasm, and they happen to be uh, heterodimers, and they're activated by a, a gas, a signaling gas. And signaling gases are kind of cool because they go, they're real small, and so there's no transporter, so they go from one cell type to the next very fast, and then their half-life is very fleeting. So you get this nitric oxide signal, it's called NO, and it goes from one cell type, and we'll look at an example of that, and it turns on guanine cyclic. So cyclic GEP should go up in response to getting a blast of nitric oxide. Okay. All right, so we're, we're getting a little bit uh, drowsy here, I can, I can tell. Um, let's do a clicker. Thank you. 
So answer it as an individual first. Which one? Um, question number one. So you've got this, this is one of those, the answer set applies to several different questions. So if you want to answer if BIP. <coughs> yeah.
receptor, right? So it's going to, because you have to identify that the resident protein, is it a membrane protein or is it a soluble protein? Only soluble proteins use the KNO receptor. If you're a membrane uh, receptor or membrane protein that's functioning in the ER, you like calinexin, it's already got the signaling pathway built into the sequence, or not the signaling pathway, it has the uh, sequence that's in the C-terminus that's recognized by the coding machine. Okay, so that's, uh, and if I put a secular tubular cluster as one of these choices, that would also be a good answer because as uh, vesicles butt off carrying BIP to the wrong destination, they can actually uh, lose cop coated vesicles back to the ER before the vesicular tubular cluster becomes the cystical network. Because remember, really what's forming this is fusion of vesicles together using homotypic fusion. Okay, let's do just one more in this after fusion. Let's do this. Number two. <coughs> just do it as a group. And let me set up a question. Instead of just recycling it back to the eight full, it recycles it to the other opposing member. So that's good. Um, what I'd like for you to do is um, each group to take, I mean, look around, you can just talk to your members. How many people are actually still in your group? And send, send don't, don't tell me now, I don't want to. Uh, but send it to Sibeli, just say, how many people are in your group? Because it looks like a, a couple of years down to like, you know, a person and a half or something. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's sleeping. No. Uh, but send that attendance to Sibeli, because if your, your group is down to two, it's kind of problem that. Um, a lot of your group members will not give you the courtesy of telling you that they dropped. But, and I don't even know until the fall rolls come out. So uh, just send that to Sibeli, hopefully within the next day or so. Uh, so we may have to reconstruct the Thank you. 
made a protein kinase because it's no longer better for the inhibitory, uh, inhibitory subunits. And it can go in, in phosphorylate cytoplasmic proteins, but it can also go into the nucleus. Because okay. now it's displaying a nuclear localization se sequence. And if it phosphorylates this protein called CREB, that's cyclic AMP response element binding protein. That's CREB. That's why they call it CREB. Is if it phosphorylates it, then this CREB is, becomes an active transcription factor and sits on the CRE, cyclic AMP response element. You should understand what that is. And if it sits there, it can recruit a binding protein that's a coactivator, which is called CDP. And the coactivator is going to stay interact with the pre initiation complex and stabilize it and turn on the genes that are downstream. So that's how the cyclic AP system would work. Now, if you're, if this is in a, a, a testicular cell and that, that child has a, an LH receptor that's been turned on, the cyclic AP goes up. The, the PKA goes into that person's nucleus and turns on an enzyme that makes testosterone. That's what would happen. So the, the protein that's downstream from this is something that's activated or inhibited by this pathway. Could this uh, be uh, a co-repressor? And could this be a repressor protein? Absolutely, it works both ways. Okay, good. That's it.